vita. Hello and welcome to a Department of Sustainable Development feature on Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. My name is Jessie Leons, Information Assistant at the Department of Sustainable Development. I'm joined by colleague Kate Wilson. She is the national focal point for the Escazú Agreement and our legal officer of, well, the Conference of the Parties will be happening for the Escazú Agreement, the third one in Santiago de Chile. I know, Kate, you are preparing for that, so thank you so much for taking some time out to speak to us today. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jesse. <laughs> you know, it's always, always a pleasure to be sitting with you to continue our dialogue on the Escazú Agreement, which full name is the Regional Agreement on Access to Information, Public Participation and Justice in Environmental Matters, not only in Latin America, but in the Caribbean, Caribbean. as well. Thank you, Kate. Um, St. Lucia and, and the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean was initially recognized as a region that, was, that did not have too many mechanisms for transparency mm -hmm. and access to environmental information. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen so, so far the, since the adoption of the ESCOZO agreement quite a bit of work that has been happening in the region. Speak to us about the extent to which the needle has been pushed mm -hmm. where ESCOZO is concerned in the region um, in terms of it's pushing its mandate in terms of public participation, environmental decision making, in environmental decision making, and justice in environmental matters. Yes, wonderful, Jesse. Indeed, as you said, it is not just pushing the thread. We have now had a, a complete needlework has been done, and um, what 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 during the first conference of parties, which took place, you know, um, under the Escazú agreement, when the agreement comes into force one year after it comes into force, you are required to have the first conference of parties. And the Escazú Agreement came into force on April 22nd, which is very aptly uh, named Mother Earth Day, mm -hmm. and it came uh, into force in 2021. So the year after, which was um, 2022, April 22nd, was when the first conference of parties was held, and it was held at the headquarters of the Secretariat to the agreement, which is the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, UN ECLAC, and they are based in Santiago de Chile. So what happened at the first conference of parties? Well, a number of things were, were um, endorsed and approved. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, we needed to create the subsidiary, first and foremost, we needed to create the rules and procedures of how we are going to conduct the conference of parties, mm -hmm. how we are go and the modalities to deal with it, how it is going to work on a day-to-day -day basis. We also needed to put in place the subsidiary bodies of the Escazú Agreement, which are committees like to support implementation and compliance. You needed to have the rules to support that. You know, to, before you can put any structure in place, you need to have rules by which they are governed. So the first conference of parties took care of that. And then the second conference of parties came, and it was an extraordinary meeting. It took place in Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina and that was in 2023 last year and this it was an extraordinary meeting simply because it is a meeting which was called for the specific purpose mm -hmm. of creating of electing sorry the members to sit on the committee to support implementation and compliance and so right now as we are coming towards the third COP and we will speak about that in mm -hmm. due course, uh, which is to be held in Santiago de Chile in next week mm -hmm. from the 22nd of April through to the 2024th, you find that the structures have been put in place, the rules are now in place, we have persons sitting on that committee, so and now the implementation plans for most countries are 
are already in place now, mm -hmm. or so, some countries are still working on them, but for St. Lucia, St. Lucia has completed its, its national roadmap. So now at this, at this um, upcoming COP, the whole intention now is to ensure that we get endorsement of the national plans so that we begin the actual work on the ground. Mm -hmm. Putting all those recommendations that are in the various national implementation plans from the countries that have worked on them, to put them in place at the national level. And most importantly, the action plan for human rights defenders. And we will talk about that. Absolutely. We and we're going to speak a little bit more about COP3 in just a moment. Um, yes. Sinusha, we ratified in 2020, December yes. of 2020. And since then, speak to us about what has happened procedurally. I understand that we, after ratification, we would have had to develop a concept note, yes. pr begin to prepare the way forward, as you indicated, preparing an implementation roadmap. Tell us what we have achieved so far at, on the ground. Okay, wonderful. So St. Lucia, uh, as you rightfully said, we were one of the first countries to get Antigua and, and Guyana who signed on the agreement when it was open for signature on the 27th of April, 2017. Um, mm -hmm. 2018, sorry. So, and then, a year after, two years after, we ratified. Mm -hmm. So after ratification, and, and you know the difference between signature and ratification, ratification mm -hmm. ensures that we are now legally bound to put the structures in place to ensure that the Escazú Agreement is implemented effectively in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So then what we embarked on doing, first and foremost, we had not, the, the Secretariat didn't have all the, proce the, the procedures and the subsidiary bodies in place at the time, so when ratification was done. So mm -hmm. what, we pro what we proceeded to do was to have, first and foremost, educate the public about what the Escazú Agreement is about, why is it important, what is the meaning of ratification, and you know, we, so we had to do that sort of thing. So we went on the ground in the schools, went all over the place, talking, you would, if, you, if you go down on YouTube, or you use the, um, on Facebook pages of the various media houses, or you look on the observatory, which serves as a clearinghouse for all things Escazú, which mm -hmm. is on, on the, um, the ECLAC Secretariat website. Mm -hmm. There is a specific website for the Escazú Agreement, which is called the Observatory, uh, Principle 10 Observatory, where you'll find so much information on the Escazú Agreement. You will see the videos of COP1, a ball-by-ball -ball commentary of what happened mm -hmm. on at, at um, video of what uh, happened at COP1 as well as COP2. So let's get into what uh, happened, the nitty-gritty. So apart from the public awareness, we had, uh, we had, as I said, we, we went through, as St. Lucia sat on a committee to put to work to, together with Mexico and Uruguay, mm -hmm. Argentina, to get the rules and, and modalities for the operation of the committee to support implementation and compliance, mm -hmm. which is a very, very important so committee. So St. Lucia was represented? St. Lucia was represented on that committee who formed the rules. You would recall at COP2, at COP, um, at at COP or was it COP1? That I pres COP presiding one, it officer. Was, right. Mm -hmm. I presented it on behalf of that of that committee, and it was adopted and endorsed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we had the rules of that. We also had the rules of the conference of parties that was adopted and endorsed. So then the the first thing we had to do was to put the committee in place. So we got we had a call. You recall you and I worked closely on that. A call was sent throughout Latin America asking for persons who. And there was a set criteria to mm -hmm. sit on that committee. We got um, at least 36 at the time. We got 36 entries mm -hmm. um, for, for persons who uh, obviously we had to do our vet. due diligence mm -hmm. and we had to vet it. We took it down to 25. It went down again to 10. And finally, we had to take it down to 7. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a rigorous process. And eventually, as I said, in Argentina mm -hmm. last year, we finally settled on the seven members. And what I'm very, very happy to say is that we have three persons um, who, are who have been elected for six years to represent. We have two from the Caribbean. We have Justice Olivetti, Rita Olivetti Joseph from Grenada. And we have Carol Excel Stevens from Jamaica. And of course, we have Patricia Madrigal from Costa Rica. These are the persons who are going to be serving for six years. And that is very good, mm -hmm. because that means we now have Caribbean representation for a significant period of time on that committee. Mm -hmm. And the committee, as its name says, implementation and compliance, to ensure that we implement what the Escazú Agreement says, and also to ensure that the member states, when they ratify, they actually comply with their obligations under the Escazú Agreement. So a lot has been done. Mm -hmm. And um, 
But the real work, you know, anything to do with the environment, doesn't, there's no time frame on it. It continues, the work must continue, the uh, advocacy must mm -hmm. continue, the public awareness, the training capacity building, the cooperation, developing cooperation with other countries, mm -hmm. with um, agencies within the country, developing partnerships, mm -hmm. putting our voluntary fund, getting it on board, because obviously when we do those pro uh, projects and we'll plans, somebody <laughs> has to pay for it. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so so St. Lucia has covered quite a bit of ground, as you indicated, Indeed. in public e education, public awareness of the Escazoo Agreement. Um, the whole idea of access to environmental information, mm -hmm. um, the whole idea to justice for, um, for environmental for rights defenders. Mm -hmm. um, so post, or well, the um, Along with the continuation of the public awareness, speak to us about what else has transpired so far for St. Lucia towards its implementation and compliance of this agreement. Wonderful. So <coughs> what we were doing very recently is that we were from as early as, well, from, from November of last year, we worked closely with a consultant. And that consultant comes with a lot of experience. She was a, an elected representative of the public for Jamaica when we were negotiating the Escazoo Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is Mrs. Um, Danielle Andrade Goff. She's a lawyer by profession, an environmental lawyer. And as I said, she's familiar with the Escazoo process. So she worked very closely with us. She was contracted by the Secretariat, uh, ECLAC, to work with us, to work with St. Lucia. So we worked very closely with her at the Department of Sustainable Development to get our, uh, our national implementation roadmap up and running. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, the ECLAC, ECLAC as the Secretariat, they publish, they develop what is known as an implementation guide. Mm -hmm. And that guide, again, I'm imploring members of the public. It is a free thing. You don't have to pay for it. If you go on the ECLAC website, you just, you just Google ECLAC ECLAC or CEPAL, C-E-P-A-L, which is the... Um, the Spanish version of it, dot mm -hmm. org, and you scroll down there, uh, you, you would see a, 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 a line that says observatories. If you click on that, it will take you to four, I think, I think there are four or six observatories. One of them is principal 10, P10. You click on that, it will give you all the, it will take you right there to the Escazoo Agreement. And it will give you infographics, it will give you publications, as I said, it will give you the videos of the various COPs, it will give you public and PSAs, public service announcements. We have done anything that you want to find out about the Escazo Agreement. That page, that observatory, is a clearinghouse for it. And what we do is we feed information. Mm -hmm. As information comes, the, as national focal point, this is what we are required to do. The Department of Sustainable Development houses myself as the national focal point. And we feed, as the information comes in, we feed it to the Secretariat and they put it in, into the... Um, into the clearinghouse, into mm -hmm. the, the observatory. So say, for example, we have our climate change bill that has been, you know, gone through parliament. That would be something that would be there. You understand, if we have a styrofoam bill to deal with plastics and to take care of, you know, um, the styrofoam and single-use plastics, that would be on, you know, on, on, on the, um, on, on the on, in the observatory. You know, so all those different, everything to do with the environment, our our national determined contributions, mm -hmm. you, 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 you would be able to click and, and, and find you information. Know, information on that. Our state of the environment report, you, know, you may be able to find mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, so we have done that. And then we are going a little further, as I told you. We were putting the structures in place so to get this implementation plan up and running for St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So we are at the stage where it is now, it has gone to the printers mm -hmm. and this upcoming COP next week, which is mm -hmm. April 22nd to the 24th in Santiago de Chile, we will be, we will be presenting the, the, the printed version to the conference of parties for their endorsement and their approval. St. Lucia's implementation roadmap. Yes, yes. Understood. Mm -hmm. And with that, we will take a quick break. You are watching Issues and Answers, a Department of Sustainable Development feature, looking at COP3 for the Escazo Agreement. Coming up, St. Lucia will be represented by the National Focal Point, uh, Miss Kate Wilson, and she will be going over to Santiago de Chile to present, as she to indicated, the, the implementation roadmap, how St. Lucia is going to put in place the measures that have been advised under the Escazo Agreement into St. Lucia and change our way of life as it pertains to access to environmental information. Do stay tuned. Fisher folk in St. Lucia are facing many negative effects of climate change. 
la vie peut être difficile. Parce qu'il faut aller plus fort, nous pouvons pas acheter plus de fuel pour faire jouer les lames, nous pouvons dépenser plus de gasoline. En raison de ça, la vie peut être un péché difficile. Parti Waïla, c'est un bail qui a affecté nous la vie. Il a affecté vivre nous, il a affecté canon nous et il a affecté nos machines. Aussi, il a affecté le placement de péché. Si on cherche, c'est pour ça que c'est difficile pour pêcher ça à assurer quand on a appris la meilleure et puis pour adopter le changement du climat. Climate change is happening. Are you prepared? Changement climat qu'a fait. Est-ce que vous préparez? Thank you so much for staying tuned. You are watching Issues and Answers, a Department of Sustainable Development feature. We're talking COP3 for the Escazoo Agreement. Uh, we will be soon having this conference of the parties. Representing us, representing St. Lucia, will be the national focal point, Kate Wilson, along with our permanent secretary at the department, Mrs. Anita Montout. Uh, just before we went to break, uh, Kate, we were just speaking about St. Lucia being able to present this year, this year's COP, the implementation roadmap for St. Lucia. Speak to us a little bit about what that contains. I know there has been extensive consultation mm -hmm. in the lead up to yes. this, um, to the development of this roadmap. Tell us what can we expect um, going forward? Yes, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, you would recall um, lo a, a while back after we had um, ratified what the Department of Sustainable Development, what we had done was develop a concept note. We had gone through the Escazoo Agreement and picked out all the obligations and the things that we needed to put in place at the national level, and we developed a concept note. But what the Escazoo Secretariat did, they developed, after we had, um, we had developed this concept note, which was endorsed and adopted by our cabinet, the cabinet of ministers. Mm -hmm. but the secretariat uh, having developed you know the implementation plan and that implementation plan was a plan to be a guide to be used by all the countries that uh, and that is open to all 33 countries that are that are eligible to be part of the escazo agreement that is the 33 countries forming the latin american and, and caribbean region so far we have i think we have 15 who have ratified mm -hmm. and we have maybe about 22 or 23 who have signed on but um, among those, we have those that uh, a, a number of countries as were developing the roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so we have moved past that concept note. And that roadmap, as I said, we had, we were working closely with Mrs. Andrade, who is the, the, who was the consultant contracted by the Secretariat to assist us. And this comes with a significant consultation with the public, so the, the first thing we had to do was develop a baseline assessment of all our laws, our policies, our plans to see if they are in line with the Escazoo Agreement. We also looked at our constitution to see, you know, in, in certain countries of Latin America, they already have rights of nature, rights of the environment as part of the, enshrined in the constitution. We do not have that. So one of the, the, the main things as part, as in the development of that roadmap, the national implementation roadmap, was to do the baseline assessment. Mm -hmm. The second thing they did was to do a stakeholder, you know, to, to, to have what is known as a, a mapping of stakeholders who is the Escazoo agreement intended for so you must know that you must have a target audience so we had to look of course you know as I said before and I keep saying this environmental matters should not be handled by governments alone they are cross-cutting in nature and everybody should have a seat at the table at the decision-making table so of course we had to map out who those persons are so we had we looked at the the youth, we looked at women, we looked civil at um, academia, civil society, government, you know, organizations like the National Trust, you know, the CYEN, the Caribbean Youth Environmental Network. So we, made, we had an extensive mapping of the stakeholders. So, and then we developed the stick, we, we took it down to those that are 
closer to the agreement in terms of who is going to actually implement the, you know, because you will have a smaller core group of persons who will actually be involved in the access to information process, mm -hmm. you know, and the access to justice process, which yeah. is the judiciary. And then you have the wider body, which would be a consult consultative body, mm -hmm. where everybody is involved. So we had to strategically look at that and map that out. So that was the second part of it. Then the third part we had to look at was the governance and organizational structure with everything, like a school. You must have a principal, you must have teachers, you must, and, and, and you know, who's going to guide the students? Well, it's the same thing mm -hmm. with the implementation roadmap. We must have a structure in terms of who's going to govern it, who's going to be the advisory board, who's going to be, so all of that was done. And then of course we have how the, one of the main things is to, de to develop a, how we are going to deal with human rights defenders. And let me go back to the Escazoo Agreement. The Escazoo Agreement is the only agreement in the world which has provisions for the protection, the promotion, and the, the you know the, the um, to to ensure and punish attacks against persons who are human rights defenders when of environmental matters that is mm -hmm. so when they are in the course of doing their work defending the environment they cannot be arbitrarily killed and you know our region the latin american region is one of the most dangerous region in the world mm -hmm. for human rights defenders so obviously our roadmap needed to have you know, an input in terms of how we are going to deal with human rights defenders. Now, mm -hmm. you may ask me, and I'm not going to preempt you here, but you, one may say, oh, we do not have that issue in the Caribbean. That is not so, mm -hmm. because you have in Jamaica, you have persons who are agitating against the bauxite mining and some of those, uh, those um, human rights defenders are being threatened. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, it, but it is worse in the Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. But in St. Lucia, for example, you, you have had issues where you have, had, you have seen our persons on the beach lobbying, and you, you remember that video that went viral about mm -hmm. saying, St. Lucia, we don't want anybody, we were singing the song, Jack no, don't want me to, 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 to bathe on my beach, where, you know, we were denied access. The public was being denied access to, you know, a beach that they were normally always using because of a project. You understand? Uh, and, and that's important because mm -hmm. the, uh, as you indicated, the, the Exesu Agreement reinforces that connection between human rights mm -hmm. and environmental information, environmental rights, and so on. But the line seems to be blurred for small island developing states a lot I, I, I should say because mm -hmm. once you, when you are a developing nation you mm -hmm. have foreign investment you have all of these things happening mm -hmm. then those those issues seem to be lost and, and, and displaced so I mean you indicated about the beach and mm -hmm. not having access to the beach but in what other ways do we find ourselves how, how can we reconcile that con that context for islands like St. Lucia, Dominica, Grenada? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, um, Jesse, you are quite right, because one must not forget that the Escazoo Agreement is not simply an environmental agreement or an envi en environmental treaty. It is a wonderful tool for the development of democracy, for transparency, for okay. accountability, you understand? And if you want good governance, and it is also a good tool for the achievement of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, you understand? Now, when we talk about development, we are small island developing states and we are interested in developing our people and developing the scarce resources that we have. Mm -hmm. But we must maintain a balance. And how do we do this? We must do this in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And to do this in a sustainable way, to ensure that there is equity among the, you know, the, 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 the people, that the developers don't just get the bigger pie, um, share of the pie, but that the public, their health, and the health of our flora and fauna is, are not compromised. Mm -hmm. And this is where the Escazoo Agreement is extremely important. Wonderful. You understand? The Escazoo Agreement is designed to touch the poor and the marginalized, vulnerable groups and persons, and human rights defenders, indigenous persons, fall within that group. 
Understood. Um, just circling back to COP as mm -hmm. we wrap up, yes. uh, speak to us a little bit about, well, this year's COP is going to be ordinary, but you've mentioned that we will be presenting our implementation roadmap. So I think it's quite extraordinary for St. Lucia. <laughs> um, uh, speak to us about your role particularly, just briefly, yes. um, at the COP so far. I know you've been a pres presiding officer looking at the Committee for um, Implementation and Compliance. Speak to us about that feat, because yes. quite a con considerable amount of work has gone into that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, um, what we can expect as we wrap up this interview. Okay, wonderful, Jesse. So this um, third um, COP, it's 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 not it's an ordinary meeting, and as you rightfully said, in the in the in the usual context of the word, it is extraordinary because we are going to be presenting our finally our printed version mm -hmm. of our national implementation plan. So to me, that's extraordinary. <laughs> but when we talk about an extraordinary and an ordinary meeting within the context of a conference of parties, <laughs> an extraordinary I, meeting. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> An extraordinary meeting means a meeting that is called when the parties together with the Secretariat feels that it is necessary, mm -hmm. which was what happened in last year yes, yeah. when we, were, we needed to put the committee to support implementation and compliance in place. So we call that extraordinary meeting. So, but an ordinary meeting would be a meeting of the COP that we, that we deal with, the, you know, the agenda as, 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 as per usual. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is to be at least um, once every two years, okay. which is when the ordinary meeting. So, uh, so the next one is coming up, and as I said, next week it starts on the 22nd of April, and it will go to the 24th. But then we have the 25th and the 26th when you have a few other meetings being held. Um, so you would have a meeting of the committee to support um, implementation and compliance, as well as um, other meetings to deal with you know matters extraneous to the um, to the Escazo agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so one of the things, as I said, what is going to happen on the first day, which is the 22nd, uh, as usual, for everything, you'd have the registration of, 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 of um, parties. parties. Mm -hmm. And then you will have, uh, later in the morning, from about 9, you'll have the Committee to Support Implementation and Compliance are going to hel hold their third meeting. And, of course, whatever they, are, whatever they have done over the, since they were, since the, the second, the extraordinary meeting of COP since last year, mm -hmm. they are going to report to the conference of parties to see where they're at in terms of what they've done and what structures they've developed, the modalities of operation. And that was again done through a rigorous process of consultation. Mm -hmm. There were several different versions of the rules. We gave our input and we sent it to the elected members of the public and through the regional mechanisms, they got the feedback from the public until they finally came up with, a, you know, modalities that which we, they are going to um, take to the, the conference of parties um, next week mm -hmm. for the endorsement. So that is going to be that is going to be done. Then we also will be having a meeting of the presiding officers. Mm -hmm. And you know, St. Lucia, we sit in the vice chair position. There is um, um, Uruguay chairs with um, Dr. Um, Marcello Cusias. He sits as the chair of the, of the conference of parties. And then there are four countries, St. Lucia include, included, who sits in the vice chair position. Mm -hmm. So this year, we are, so we, you are, we are going to have um, round about uh, 10 o'clock. We are going to have at the same time that the Committee to Support Implementation and Compliance are having their meeting, mm -hmm. we will be having a meeting of the presiding officers. Technically, we should both be at, this, at the same meeting, but yeah. because of, of space and time, mm -hmm. you find we, have, we are having them parallel. Mm -hmm. But again, the presiding officers are going to be reporting to the Conference of Parties what they are doing, because this is the year when we are electing new we are expected to elect new presiding officers. officers. Okay, understand. You understand? Yeah, because the, we have reached the two-year mark, and then it is now for a new speed of, of presiding officers to come on. Now, there may be one or two things. The mm -hmm. presiding officers may continue, in the, the current presiding officers may continue, mm -hmm. or we may have an election of the other presiding officers. So let me okay. very quickly tell you again. So And then, of course, there will be the opening ceremony. And as usual, if opening ceremonies, you have the president of, of Chile, mm -hmm. I expect, is going to be there. And of course, we have elected representatives of the public. But on the second day, which is the Tuesday, that is when we'll be presenting our roadmap. Mm -hmm. And of course, we will be giving a report on where we're at in terms of national implementation. So that's very, very important. Wonderful. Focal points are going to be telling what St. Lucia is doing, Antigua is going to say what Antigua is doing. So it's an exciting, exciting day. And then we have lots of side events happening, you mm -hmm. know, with those conferences. You have lots of different discussions 
on um, access to justice, access to... Um, so thanks, Jesse. It is, it no is problem. wonderful. For the sake of programming, we have to stick a pin in it. Certainly, we can continue on social media, yes. engaging the general public on what persons can expect for this year's Eskazu COP. As I indicated, you can go onto our social media platforms, uh, Department of Sustainable Development St. Lucia, on our Facebook, Instagram, and we will be following, yes. uh, while you are in Santiago de Chile, following what's happening in... Uh, in uh, the Ali Eskazu Agreements COP, and we will be providing updates round the clock. Thank you once again, Kate Wilson, our legal officer at the Department of Sustainable Development. She's also the national focal point for the Eskazu Agreement. COP3, an ordinary meeting, uh, St. Lucia will be presenting its implementation roadmap for yes. how we will see the Eskazu Agreement implemented here on island. We're talking about access to environmental information, public participation in uh, environmental decision making as well as justice for environmental rights defenders here on island thank you so much for watching again the conversation continues on our social media platforms we will be providing very um some snippets on basic ways you can um, understand better uh, the escazo agreement and what it intends to do for countries like saint lucia and the rest of latin america and the caribbean my name is Jesse Leons, Information Assistant at the Department of Sustainable Development. Do stay tuned for more programming on this station. Goodbye. Thank you.